Love Stories, we walk and we talk with inspiring and forward-thinking people. Obviously, as a writer, you do have to sit. It's one of the hazards of writing, but whenever I get stuck or at the end of the day after I've written something and I don't know where I'm going next, whenever I go walking, and I, I do it with my wife usually every day and our dog, something you know moves in your brain like a watch mechanism or something. It moves another wheel, and suddenly I know where I'm going the next day. In this new episode, we walk in the forest of Connecticut with writer Jay Fielden. We talk press, poetry, and unforgettable shoes. Welcome to the John Law Podcast. The city makes everybody walk faster. The walking for me really started intensely when I was still editing Esquire and going into the city every day. I would ride the train into Grand Central and walk from Grand Central to uh, my office building, which was, I would say, a good, you know, a good mile or so. And I, I would do that going and coming. And that way, no matter what happened in the day that scuttled my plans to be a good boy who's always exercising, uh, I would always at least be walking two miles. I don't think there's a word for what I'm doing right now. I'm, uh, that's part of the, the thing I'm trying to discover. If I really defined who I am, you know, I'm an editor and a writer. And then it's strange to me in some ways that it stretches into other realms and domains. I mean, certainly I love the world of, of style and clothes and cars and watches and whiskey and wine and the so-called finer things and the stories that those realms have to tell about history and people. That means I sometimes work, you know, by writing magazine pieces or, or, or publishing poetry. I create things for other partners that call me and, and do things with me, whether it's brands or marks of various different kind. Um, I'm working on my own. Probably the biggest thing I'm doing right now is trying to figure out how those all those things get married into one project. And that project is a subscription digital weekly with a niche sensibility um, about taste and style that I'm working on right now. Of all the things that I've created for other people, Men's Vogue, Town and Country, Esquire, I I now want to create a thing that I that I that is for me and 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 for the 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 readers that that want to go on the journey with me. But I think I am uh, very much built to be a bit of a flibberty gibbet, as we say, and kind of enjoy the freedom of finishing with one project and starting another one. And that really suits my metabolism for some reason. I think it always has. It's probably why I succeeded at making magazines. I'm very interested in the idea of what makes something exceptional and rare and great and if that can be put in words and then understood as a standard. So through time, there's a, a kind of human record of, of what is considered great as time passes, so to speak. That comes initially from my study as, a, as an English major, uh, you know, who considered going into the world of literary criticism, meaning getting a PhD in English literature and, you know, becoming a professor and that kind of thing. And I, when you encounter topics like, why is Keats a great poet? And what about his poetry set standards about what, how other poems would be, me you know, against which other poems would be measured? Well, I, I just love that, that pursuit, as difficult as it is. And, I, and then I saw that, you know, in a different way, though in, in a similar and valid way, questions like that also come up when you're thinking about a beautiful pair of shoes or um, an amazing Swiss watch or... Um, an exceptional bottle of wine, a great meal, a great trip, a beautiful tie. Th these things have standards through time. They're not just, they can't just be measured by the, the moment that they're produced. They have to, if they are going to ever claim any greatness, they have to be able to be measured against a historical example. I grew up in Texas. I was born in West Texas in kind of a rough and ready part of the state that was very much 
built on oil and cattle, um, the fortunes or the money and, and people's, the, the hierarchy of, you know, society was based on money made from those enterprises. My father was a dentist and my mother was a ballet teacher and we ended up moving to San Antonio, which is a good six hours east of West Texas. Um, and San Antonio is an old, elegant city that was founded by the Spanish, one of the oldest cities in, in the Americas. Um, I, I already had some idea of what an elegant life was like because I had seen the difference between the people who were playing golf in West Texas and those who weren't and who were driving a, a great Cadillac and those who weren't. Even if some of it was flashy money, I, I started to get a sense, I think, of, of, of that there is a difference, you know, between a Seiko and a Rolex. I might not have been able to articulate that for a long time, but as I started reading as well and teaching myself through that reading, reading magazines especially, and I started reading magazines, I would say, when I was around 14, there was a kind of big epiphanic moment for me where I just discovered these things called magazines. And at the time, the ones that I really loved were M Magazine, Esquire, GQ, The New Yorker, the New York Times magazine. It was that combination of both seeing magazines that were overtly talking about things you could buy, you know, and, and showing them on a monthly basis from clothes to, to shoes to watches to cars, you know, the whole thing. And then also reading books in w by sophisticated writers were from a generation in which that was also something that seemed to play into the kind of stories they were interested in. For instance, The Catcher on the Rye, you know, of, of course a seminal book for me, as it was for so many people. You know, Holden Caulfield has a very acute sense of how social status is understood at, in the 1950s and, and what it meant to have certain things or shop at certain places or stay at certain hotels or go to certain restaurants. And um, so I was already kind of queuing into the fact that there's a world way outside of mine in San Antonio um, that I wanted to understand and be a part of. When I was about 17, I wanted to go to Yale for college and I applied thinking I would get a leg up, you know, in the admissions, I, I applied to a summer program they had for uh, juniors in high school. Um, so me, uh, my best friend and I um, applied and we got in and we went to Yale the summer of 1987. And Yale, of course, is in New Haven, which is about an hour and a half uh, outside of New York by train. And so we would, we met a lot of kids uh, from New York who were going to Yale at the same time and um, befriended them and they would invite us to go into the city and stay at their apartments on the weekend. That was my first impression of New York. The visual intensity of, of a city like New York, even now, of course, but, you know, then because of, uh, you know, having not just been prepared for it, I guess I had seen, I had studied it. As I said, I had, I had read books that had taken, that took place in New York. I'd seen a tent, tons of every Woody Allen movie ever made. So I had memorized where these scenes were and Elaine's, the restaurant on the Upper East Side and the Paris Theater um, at the southeast corner of Park, uh, of the park, of Central Park. All the places that seemed, you know, the West Village, the places that seemed like well-read, sophisticated, stylishly dressed, interesting people would go in New York. I wanted to go to all those places. And I, I made a point of, you know, kind of walking because at the, you know, as a 17 year old kid, I wasn't gonna like spend hundreds of dollars on cabs. So I walked, you know, with my friends and we, we went to all those places, the museums, and I made a, a special beeline to the mansion at 72nd and Madison. I was uh, uh, pretty uh, taken with Ralph Lauren at the time, especially through the magazine ads. And I went into that uh, store, which, you know, blew me over in all ways you can imagine. and. Uh, there was a sale going on. It was August. I was unprepared for that. And they had this beautiful pair of white and brown spectator bench-made shoes that I think were $118, if I remember correctly. Now, I remember this was 1987, so they probably were originally $300 or something like that. And here they are marked down to 118 And they're not quite the right size, but, you know, with a shoehorn and, you know, ex exhaling my breath, I could get my foot into it. And I convinced my mother over the phone 
to let me buy them. And I owned those shoes until we had a fire in our house and, and they burned up with a few other key pieces, including a beautiful pair of John Lobs. But I still miss them. I miss those things, you know? I think about those shoes sometimes, the Lobs as well, for instance. Um, I had forgotten that I lost them in the fire. You know, every once in a while, you'll find yourself looking for something and thinking, oh, I just misplaced it. What did I do with that? Did I give that away? Did somebody borrow it from me? Um, and then you realize, oh no, it was the fire. I've gotten such great enjoyment and out of it, to be honest with you. I, I really have. I, I, I've never understood the kind of person who has no interest in what they put on. It, it's not that I look down on them or, or think that they should be like me necessarily, but when I think of the enjoyment, you know, the pure enjoyment, the knowledge, the discovery of the things, the finding them, the hunt, the acquisition of something that's rare and, and that I'm going to love for a long time, even though you can't see the fingerprints, would have the mark of a fine craftsman who made it made it and and I and I want to support that because I know that even though a brand may be listed on the stock exchange um, that many of the the hands that are creating these things aren't and they're regular people making regular salaries but they are craftsmen they are in some ways in the world of artistic creation and I feel a kinship toward that I think that's one thing that really draws me to the things that are that are that are finally made. It's a kinship with the people who are making them because I think of myself as somebody who makes things by hand. I, I always said a magazine is made by hand once a month. <laughs> you know, everything in it is made by hand, even though we don't think of it like that. It is a handmade product. So um, I think that's probably the secret. If I knew my own subconscious, I think that that's true. I, I just feel like getting dressed should be enjoyable and it should make sense in terms of the way you want to present yourself to the world. It should be a reflection of who you are and your taste, um, your personality, not a replication of an ad or a, or something like that. And I think that's probably also why if my magazines were any good, they were soaked in that kind of enthusiasm for the things I was talking about. Or And, and if the thing that I create now is, is any good, I think it will feel like it believes in the things that it talks about and and wants to share the you know the deep uh, joy and, and fun of that these things can provide I started here I mean I started to really know about lob when I started editing men's Vogue in 2005 the idea of men's Vogue uh, I think, if I could say it, was a little before its time, unfortunately, um, in the sense that we're going after finding things to write about, whether they were suits or sneakers or, or, or shoes or watches or experiences or what have you, that, you know, really were exceptional. And we're probably going to almost always involve some level of handmadeness. And, of course, Lob was a very big name, remains a big name, and um, I remember doing a story on Lob and then visiting the, the atelier in Paris and, um, you know, just getting close to the people who, who are involved in, in developing it from the, from the shoemaker on up. And it was about that time that I got my first pair of Lobs, and, I, and I, they speak for themselves. I think, you know, you can go around talking about how well they're made or that there's 190 you know, steps that go into the ready-to-wear shoes that you can buy in the store. Um, and that's obviously all true, but I think you have to put them on, you have to hold them, you feel the leather, you feel the the substantialness of the way that they're made. Um, not that they're heavy, but, you know, you just feel something about them. And and I think you then see the detail and they're just beautiful things, right? They're, they're very, very beautiful things. I mean, I think, if anything, they're so beautiful, you sometimes don't want to, to wear them. <laughs> That's me, at least. <laughs> but, but I do wear them. So these were the, a double strap, kind of tobacco-colored brown pair. I, I don't know if they're made anymore. The, the last, I think, was the 8,000 last. Does that make sense? The buckles were parallel. They kind of pulled around to the side more than spread out. 
in opposite directions. They had no other detail on them except for the, the straps. And they were ex extremely, you know, comfortable, I have to say. They were very comfortable. They were really easy to get on. You know, they were really easy to wear. They went with all kinds of things, you know. They were kind of remarkable in the sense that, like, yeah, of course they looked really fantastic with any kind of suit you might have come up with. But I wore them all the time with jeans. I wore them, you know, I could practically wear them with shorts. I mean, you know, they were really, I think, spoke for themselves and, and did work on their own that um, they didn't need to be necessarily combined with anything else to, to be the, the one thing that if you wore it, you had something great on and you had a style, uh, you, you immediately had a kind of sense of, uh, a, a, you were conveying some kind of style just by putting the shoes on. I've had, I've had I'd say five, five or six pair. I would still have all those pair. Uh, um, I, I do have a kind of open-mindedness to new styles. Uh, I'm not somebody who's just um, caught in, in one period of time in terms of look, but I also uh, know that when you buy a pair of lobs, you're buying them, I, and I'm not exaggerating, for, for life. And the only reason that I have been separated from the pair I'm talking to you about, because they burned up in a fire and couldn't be saved. I did was able to save some other shoes that were in the fire, but these were just in the wrong place. And that, that kills me when I think about it. I think the pain is in somewhere located in the fact that I've forgotten that they're gone. And that tells you something, to, to, to force yourself to forget something that you loved was t taken away, tells you how painful it must have been, right? I mean, just thinking back on m m me at the time and knowing that with, with the fire and the other things that the fire took and the things that the fire didn't take, which none of us was hurt, which is the most important part, of course, but we are human and you you attach yourself to material things, especially your favorite things. And, and those were both a favorite thing and a thing that represented a time. Uh, something that special, I think, we're talking about things that you're not buying on a weekly basis, obviously. You know, if you're gonna buy a pair of $2,000 shoes, you're going to do it very occasionally. And it's probably going to be, mark a moment in your life that you won't forget, at least for me. I think those shoes held those memories. They, they, they were talismanic in that way. And, you know, so they're, they're all s tied up in a lot of different emotions. And, and, and also I think the, the wisdom of both enjoying the things that you're able to have, but living by that, that great piece of advice, you know, from Matthew about not storing up for yourselves treasures on earth, you know, because of moths and rust and thieves, and the only thing he left out there was fire. It's hard to decide what pair to, to wear, um, to be honest, because I, I, have, I, have, I have three pairs right now. One did survive the fire, a pair of Marldons that are brown. So they're almost 17, 18 years old, if you can believe that. And they look, you know, like they did pretty much the year I bought them. Then I have these beautiful double buckle um, apron front beauties that I think are the, I think are the Senon, are called Senons. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's still that name this year, but I got them maybe two or three years ago and they're like really stunning. But the ones I'm wearing are a pair of, of Scotch grain lace-ups that I got after actually going to Cornwall and, and walking along the coast where John Lobb himself walked. I love the grain. I love the, the, the very uh, soft leather, you know, kind of pliable, um, you know, so super, again, this kind of shoe that um, somehow is both casual and formal at the same time. The, and the juxtaposition of, of, of that to me has always been like a, a key mark of great style, you know, to be able to combine something that is, that is, um, comes from the world of formality, handmadeness, you know, really kind of finished in a, in a top way, but also can, can feel very much just, just thrown on or appropriate for almost anything you want to wear with it. 
that's what these feel like. And of course, they're lovely to walk in. I think I was always intrigued by the idea of, okay, wow, weird, you know. Why has, why have I always been drawn to writers who would be talked about in the sense of being stylists? When people talk about great stylists in terms of writers and, you know, examples would be Hemingway, who still, when you read the work, you understand that he sounds different than than really anyone else, even though many people have tried to sound like him, he sounds different himself. Uh, Fitzgerald was a great, beautiful stylist, more of a romantic voice, not the pared down uh, modernist style of Hemingway. And then, you know, you just go forward. I mean, all kinds of writers from Philip Roth to Saul Bellow to Joan Didion um, to Tom Wolfe. Uh, a lot of those people also had, believe it or not, a sense of style off the page. I think Fitzgerald cared about those things and Saul Bellow cared about those things. And Tom Wolfe, Mr. White Suit, which echoed Mr. Mar you know, Mark Twain, Mr. White Suit, also cared about those things. So I think we're living in a time now where there's seen to be, unfortunately, for whatever reason, less writers who feel comfortable letting themselves be creative and other compartments of their life beyond writing. Um, but to me, I just don't understand it. Because I think if you're an aesthetic person and you, and you have an eye for things, um, an appreciation of unusual, beautiful, um, compelling objects, um, how can you just apply that interest to one thing? I can't do it. I have to be who I am and I, th I think I, I, I show that um, the reason that I'm interested in these things isn't simply to lord my luck in, in having some of these things or having been around some of these things or experienced some of these things. I love them because I think they might make life all the more interesting and all the more rich. Well, we're having a poetic moment right now, Mark. My beautiful Australian shepherd that we rescued from West Virginia just you know, hopped out through the tall green grass to say hello. So he didn't, he didn't bark, but he's among us now. Um, uh, <laughs> um, well, okay, so I, lo I loved poetry starting in high school, kind of that same period of time. Again, I, you know, instead of convincing myself if I loved T.S. Eliot and, and um, uh, um, that, I, that to be a serious person, I had to give up my interest in um, these more, uh, what, these, these, these more visual interests of mine. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to see, again, why, how I could love T.S. Eliot and take that very seriously and think about the predicament of, of our, our souls and our lives and, and the, the, the big questions that surround those things, but also have a moment where um, I indulge these other interests. Um, these were parallel tracks to me, and because I had models of... of people like Eliot, who certainly did, did not live the life of, of a Walton, and I'm referencing a, a show that was on uh, American TV in the 1980s about a, a group of farmers in, I believe, West Virginia or Kentucky who, you know, wore overalls and, 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 and looked pretty dowdy like many of my ancestors. Um, Eliot didn't think he had to pretend to be a bohemian or, or a pauper um, in order to be a serious person. So, you know, he was a great wearer of three beautiful three-piece suits, for instance. Um, so, you know, again, I, I, I didn't want to just let go of, of that idea, like, or believe what seemed to be a kind of force in intellectual culture, which was, if you're an intellectual, you can't also be interested in style um, of the kind we've been talking about. So. Um, I got interested in all those kinds of poets. I wanted to write poetry. Um, I knew that sounded in some ways silly in, in the sense that poetry, if we're honest, started, I think, to lose its, the spotlight on it culturally, you know, sometime after the Second World War. I, I think with the death of, of a Robert Frost, with an Eliot, with Pound, with some of the, the bigger uh, figures, you know, it, it came to be seen as a, 
a smaller activity that still mattered but was more academic and was in special journals and, um, you know, uh, yeah, lovely, great for you, good. Why don't you be a poet, you know, if you have an inheritance or something like that, right? And I ended up publishing some poetry in The New Yorker. At that time, I was pretty young, you know, I don't know, 27 or 28. Then quickly, it kind of vanished before my eyes. I, I, I got married, I got a job at Vogue, I became the arts editor of Vogue, then suddenly I'm, I'm the editor-in-chief of Men's Vogue, and I'm editing that for four years, and, and, and life and circumstances and children and distractions and paying bills and all that, I think, uh, convinced me that poetry was a silly thing to be interested in beyond maybe reading Milton because I love Milton or reading the poets that I love but not really writing it. After I left Esquire in 2019, I just talked to myself and, and, and realized how silly and stupid that idea was. You know, you, again, you have to do what you think you're made to do. And I started writing poetry again. And it was a kind of a big creative return f for me. And I th that's what this period of my life has been like. I have stepped away from the big responsibilities that I had, you know, managing people, a p &L, you know, of many millions of dollars. And you know, uh, global trotting around to keep relationships going and being involved with the photography and being involved with the editing of the pieces and the ideas of the pieces and all the things that are involved in something like that, which I really deeply loved and I, and I still do and I miss it. But doing this thing now gives me the freedom to pursue these other things and I, I don't want to make that sound overly rosy because it's very scary, you know. It very much goes against the culture that's not to say I, I'm not making myself out to be a hero in that way, uh, because as you can see, it's taking me many years to realize I should be doing what I'm doing or some form of it, right? And maybe there's somebody out there who's smarter than I am and won't take so long to do it. I don't regret anything that I've done. I, I'm really proud of uh, the magazines I've edited and the, and the pieces I wrote when I was a magazine editor. And, and, uh, but I really am now confronting, I think, writing and the creative side of me, the storytelling, in a different way. And I, th I think it's, it's deeper and it's, it's, it's more serious as a result. Of course, I want to make clear, I'm not just writing poetry. That I, if that were the case, I'd, I'd have to live in a teepee instead of a house. Um, you know, I do have to put together um, other, other projects. Um, uh, and that's where the speeding up comes, right? And I, I always have, I've learned to juggle a lot of different balls, spin a lot of different plates. What other cliche can I come up with um, during the, 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 the time of magazines? Um, but I'm very much doing that now. I, you know, I have to do it. So I, I began to find ways of, I think, balancing better um, the things I was, the things I do for other people, which I really like doing, and I, and and is important for me to keep doing, uh, for other organizations, for other for brands, say in the in the luxury world, but also you know it allows me to kind of keep that other side of things on the weekend or what have you, where I'm not distracted from the writing that I'm doing, whether it's poetry or writing for for magazines, uh, you know, etc or trying to develop the project I told you about, which I'm very close to having, or you know, also working on a book, I can, I can keep those things, I think, in a more, uh, more, more protected from one another um, and, and allow them to each get the attention they deserve. Oh, I always have an idea, are you kidding? These things, these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. Uh, I want the, I want a pair of the, of, of, you know, of ankle boots. And I've always wanted that. Uh, I wouldn't even offhand want to um, uh, specify exactly which one because I think it would be very hard to choose. There, there, there's a few that, that have the rubber sole and I'd want to consider those very highly, but I might also just want one of the really sleek um, you know, minimal, elegant, gorgeous leather um, with leather bottoms numbers. They're uh, hard not to love. <laughs>